Exceptional Field Service Delivery creates, magnifies, and sustains exceptional customer experiences and brand loyalty. Welcome to the Super FM Podcast, Field Service Your Way, with me, Michael Israel. I'll lead conversations about critical issues in today's field service ecosystem with knowledgeable and experienced service management professionals. Now, let's learn something. Hello and welcome to Zuper FM Field Service Your Way with your host, Michael Israel. Michael, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I am excited along with the rest of the audience because anybody who's listened to your previous podcast know that this next person coming up, David Knorr, has been on before, but you guys are kind of turning the tables, right, Michael? Yeah, we're turning the tables this time. As you say, I'm going to be uh, interviewing Nor and asking him about his background, and he and I have already agreed to hide some of that background uh, in the podcast. <laughs> None but, of that um, is true. Yeah. Not- <laughs> <laughs> deny, deny, deny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Michael. Well, thank you so much, David. Uh, uh, Mr. Nor, should, should I say Mr. Nor? Or just are no, we? Please, formal? you do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna look around for my dad. No, just Nor is <laughs> Nor is fine. Nor, thank you so much for coming back, Michael. Have a great time. Nor, it's great to be back with you. I know that you and I have worked together on a number of occasions, and I always enjoy it a great, great deal. So I I know something about you, but uh, our audience probably doesn't. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions as a introduction. Would you please share with us your background? Uh, I think it's very, very interesting. And then also move on to and talk about what NOR Group is and what you do at the NOR Group. Mm. Very kind. It's good to be back with you. And you're right. You and I have some history together, and it's always, always delightful. So for the audience, I'm the quintessential uh, American dream poster child. I uh, originally from Iran. I came to the U.S. in 1981 with a suitcase, 100 bucks. Didn't know anybody and didn't speak a word of English. I literally landed at JFK with a badge around my neck, put this kid on a Eastern airline flip to Atlanta uh, when Eastern was around, and uh, he doesn't speak you know, a, a word of English. So I came and lived with an aunt and uncle in the outskirts of Atlanta. I finished high school here, got my Eagle Scout here. Mom and dad stayed behind. Uh, Mom recently passed away, but dad is still alive, and, and they're retired teachers in Persian literature and Persian history. Uh, I grew up here, I uh, have 42 first cousins, 36 of which still live back in Iran. Uh, and uh, now that I'm a parent, I just can't imagine what an incredibly unselfish thing to do to kind of let your kid go and, and build a, a, what you perceive and, and hope and pray to be a better life. So I grew up here undergrad, I started in engineering, uh, a chance for the computer science, took a business law class and completely fell in love with complexity of business. Early part of my career was technology, so IBM, Silicon Graphics, business objects. Mid-career, I went the consulting route and then uh, Emory for the executive MBA program. Got recruited as president of a startup, went up to New York, raised a round of funding, Emerged and sold that business. Uh, spent several years at a private equity firm where we bought and sold 110 different companies. And uh, for your audience, I'm actually 95 years old. I look great for 95. <laughs> Matter of for opinion, the last, right? <laughs> for the last, <laughs> for the last 20 years, I've been running the Nor Group. Uh, we're a uh, boutique advisory firm, really passionate and focused on strategic relationships. And the application of those relationships from everything from strategy to driving really profitable revenue growth. Uh, I've been blessed to write several books and uh, I coach, I speak, I advise uh, enterprises, large enterprise companies, as well as early stage, uh, well-funded organizations that are really trying to drive profitable growth. So that's a little about me and what we do. Well, gee, I, I was hoping you might tell us something interesting. <laughs> That's coming up. That's a little later in the show. <laughs> so, yeah, that's great. No, I'm I'm very very well aware of your background and the work the work that you do, and I admire the work that you do very very much. I know you do excellent work for your clients. So you mentioned books. Uh, I must say that you are a prolific writer. Mm. Uh, I think you're right up there with Stephen King almost. Except that <laughs> I, I wish book. I was you know right, selling his kind of books. <laughs> Yeah, except that, you know, none of the books of yours that I've read have kept me at, uh, awake at night in fear. So 
you have the uh, you have a you have an advantage over him as yeah. far as that's concerned. Yeah, uh, very kind so, of you to mention. Yeah, I, I tell most you know friends that, that they're they'll be delighted to hear I'm not writing Harry Potter. Right, I'm never yeah. gonna get never gonna get wealthy writing books. But if you look at uh, any any anybody who's been in any role for twenty years, particularly a consulting, advisory, executive, coaching world, Michael, I, I'm I'm blessed to see a lot of different business models work with a lot of different, and we'll talk more about this, mm -hmm. leaders and leadership styles. And when I see you know several different clients struggling with very similar issues, the light bulb goes off that this isn't just a company or an industry or a geography issue. So I get really curious, and, and that curiosity really drives my, it really is the spark for my journey into researching a topic, and at some point you've read enough, you've talked enough, you've consulted enough, you've coached enough around a topic that you feel like you have something to say. So I'm blessed that I've written 11 books, I'm currently writing number 12, and they're all around this idea of strategic relationships, of really driving strategy, driving growth, and I, I use case studies, I interview a whole bunch of executives, I've got several grad students that do social science research for me. Mm. And and it, the fascinating part is I actually learn more about my own books after they come out. Because friends like you read them and you push back or you ask questions or I, I, I speak and it's, it's uh, fascinating if not frightening. People quote you back to you. Right. You right. said on page 26 that this, what about this? And you're like, uh, I don't know. Let me look into that. Uh, but it's a, it's a great learning and growth opportunity. And it also becomes a $10 business card where it opens up doors for you to go and speak and coach and work, work with really interesting companies. Sure. That's great. So can you take us on a little bit of a journey with regard to your books? I know you're working on book number 12. So you started on, uh, was the first one relationship economics? It was, and it's actually mm -hmm. the the best selling one. We've sold, I think, a couple mm -hmm. hundred thousand copies of that one, and Wiley published it. And book number twelve is actually a complete rewrite of that first one. So, the premise of that one was everybody intellectually understands that relationships are important, and this is this will really come in handy in the field service, customer service, customer experience space. Everybody understands that relationships are intellectually you know important. Very few people are intentional, Michael, are strategic, and are mm -hmm. quantifiable about their relationship investments. So in relationship economics, I, I talk a lot about how to turn everyday contacts, and that is as relevant inside the organization as it is external to it. How do you turn everyday contacts into really valuable relationships? How do you nurture them? How do you sustain them? How do you, in essence, bridge relationship creation to relationship capitalization. That is what I would call a nor nugget. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very I'm very fond of your nuggets, these little catchy phrases that are memorable and make a very, very powerful point. So um, it, it seems to me, and this is probably a very obvious statement, that your, your whole business of writing about relationships and relationship economics and co-create is another one of your other books and curve benders is another of your books. They're all about uh, relationships, as you said, both internally and externally. Can you talk specifically a little bit about how that philosophy and the actions that people need to take uh, appropriately are relevant to the customer service and the field service environment? Sure, it's a great question. And I, I want the audience to really think about the life cycle of a field service customer service professionals, right? And especially the, the leadership that leads them. So if you look at uh, key strategies such as how do I turn our service organization from a cost center to potentially a revenue and growth engine? Uh, how do I attract, retain, develop exceptional talent? How do I get buy-in from different parts of the organization to whether it's you know, designing for service at the you know in our R and D function, all the way through investing in parts and repair depots and really strategic service partnerships. Michael, I would submit that the connective tissue between key strategies that are going to elevate awareness, impact, value creation by field service leaders is relationships. 
the relationships they choose to invest in, the relationships they cascade through their teams to proactively nurture, the relationships they build with, and you've seen this firsthand, field technicians, the relationships they establish with district and region offices and certainly international locations if you have them, are right. all predicated by the breadth, the depth, the quality of the relationships you identify, you nurture, and you sustain over time. In my books, I give the audience a playbook on how to do that consistently, effectively, impactfully. And can you extend that somewhat also to not just within the organization, as you just talked about, but also external to the organization? How do the relationships, um, how important are the relationships with the customers and how do the relationship, how does relationship development impact customer relations, relations and customer longevity, et cetera? Uh, unequivocally, yes. So think about it. I, one of the things that I so admire about field service professionals is their best day is when nothing goes wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. But but that's seldom the case. Right. The reason they call service, the reason that, you know, we need your help is something isn't working. The machine has failed or it's the, the, the value that we were promised and we need out of your technology, out of your solution isn't delivering. So think about a cut. And I want your audience to really think about their own world for a second. Think about a customer where. You've added value, you've nurtured the relationship, you know them, they know you, you know their significant others, you may know their kids. So let's just say that there's some depth there. If, and by the way, if you don't fail as a field service professional, you're not human. Let's just, let's just all agree to that, right? You're not human. Yep. It's not that, that you failed, it's what you and your team and your organization choose to do about it after a misstep, after, you know what, we didn't have the right parts on the truck, or we weren't able to get to you today, whatever it is, right? It's not that, you know, we all have missteps or we fail, but we, well, in our experience and everything we've measured, everything we've researched, if you, if you have a deep relationship with that customer, they're not only more forgiving, but they, they understand, they empathize, they will continue to want to work with you. By the way, they want more of you, more of your services, more of your solutions. You actually have a, a much better chance of upsell and cross-sell of additional services, whether it's preventive or parts on site or whatever else it may be. Conversely, think about a relationship, external customer relationship, where you don't have any of that depth. First time you make a mistake, they're, they're up in arms, they're upset, they're always right. looking for a cheaper solution, a better solution, somebody else to replace you with. You're going to get maybe annual re you know, renewals of your service contract versus multi-year. They're squeezing you on margins. So if you invest in the relationship early and often, you tend to set the stage not for just the transaction, but the opportunity for you and your service organization to truly transform their business, which is profoundly a deeper value add. So I know that you've done some work with a number of uh, companies that I'm familiar with as well. How, and, and I think one of them especially relates to exactly what you just said, and that is uh, extending the relationship, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, importance of the relationship with the customer beyond just the office, but out to the field, to the field technicians and the field engineers, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about how you've done that with uh, you know, how you've educated and mentored management to do that in their organizations with some of the a couple of the organizations that you've worked with? Sure. So uh, let me let me just kind of focus on three things. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're going to you're going to chuckle at this. I asked a, uh, a leader recently, how, you know, tell me about your priorities. And he says, we've got 69 priorities. And I'm like, respectfully, you have no priorities, right? Mm -hmm. Most people can't remember more than more than a few. So number one, really having a succinct set of strategic priorities. And Michael, here's the key that are relationship centric, right? You, 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 mo none of us are an island. Key strategies, key initiatives, you want to move forward. Identifying which relationships are critical to your success is a really good starting point. Number two really prioritizing those investments. I, I often say, you know, very few of us make investments blindly. So how proactive are you in investing in that division, department, function inside the organization, but also that client, that partner, those collaborators? Michael, one of the fascinating things we're seeing in field service is organizations who may have previously seen each other as competitors are now co-opetition. 
They're mm-hmm. finding opportunities to work together on common, think of frameworks, common standards, common ways of being able to support or service each other's technologies or cross technologies. So if you prioritize your strategic focus, direction, what relationships you need to help you get there, which relationships can we cascade? The other thing I'm a big believer of and I often tell leaders is just like our kids, employees, team members around us are watching what we do and that carries far greater weight than what we say we do. So don't tell me yeah. you're in the relationship business if you don't treat others like a relationship, like a genuine partner versus just a transaction. I don't want to be a vendor. I don't I don't let people treat me like a vendor. I want to be a peer. And that's another thing that service leaders, I believe, could do a much better job of is really model the relationship behaviors they want to cascade through their organizations. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you very much. So um, could you comment a little bit about what you think the impact of technologies in field service and customer service technologies such as field service management systems, Internet of Things, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, et cetera. How do they impact um, relationship the relationships that uh, field service organization has with its customers? And how do they help promote that kind of behavior that you're uh, that you're advocating? That's a great question, uh, and and a uh, a a just an interesting reference that the entire chapter six of the new uh, relationship economics third edition that I'm writing is literally on the role of AI in strategic mm. relationships. So I'm a huge believer that there's a lot of mundane tasks. There's a lot of um, inefficiencies, uh, Michael. There's a lot of uh, rudimentary work that field service organizations regrettably have to do. Think yep. administrative, think reviewing data, think just just a lot of that stuff that, I mean, I recently saw, and, and your audience may, may be surprised by this or may not, I recently saw a demonstration of a AI engine that scanned and reviewed 10,000 sheets of pretty complex information in eight seconds. So why not let technology do that heavy lifting? What it can't do, that technology can't look someone in the eye. They can't shake their hand. They can't, you know, really convey that feeling of warmth of the embrace, right? By the way, we also can't do that virtually. So, mm-hmm. so sociologists and anthropologists tell us that those are some of the aesthetic ways we as human beings gain a sense of belonging. We feel that we matter, that we earn and lend trust. We move relationships forward. So let the technology do the heavy lifting, gathering data, analyzing data, presenting that data, uh, anal- you know, comparing, contrasting normal versus abnormal data, uh, scanning networks and systems. I've seen some really interesting field service technology that, that mm-hmm. AI and ML will do in that arena. What it cannot do is the creative thinking, it cannot do that empathy, that human connection, the the warmth that the customers feel when that service technician shows up, I've yet to find an AI system that can do that. The, the, The trust that an employee feels when a field service manager or leader takes them under their wings and teaches them how to be a servant leader, how to be an empathetic leader, how to lead by example, I've yet to find the AI or ML engine that will do that, right? So we're very much living in a modern, hyper-aware, always on digital and a highly predictive era. So my counsel to field service leaders is you cannot bury your head in the sand and say this isn't coming. It is here. It will impact your labor pool. It will impact a lot of your systems that you're using today. But I believe it will do it for the better. Because if it can anticipate, if it can predict, if it can help your, and a good example, uh, we're working with a client where they wanted their field technicians to have a really good idea of what they're walking into when they got on site. Mm -hmm. So they've built an engine that has got some AI capabilities that learns from every interaction and it's doing exactly that. Instead of the field technician showing up and saying, what's the problem today? 
to actually show up with a potential solution. Hey, here's mm -hmm. what I think the problem is. Here's what I think I can do to quickly fix it. And now we're becoming much more efficient because we're letting the technology do the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to stay on this path for just a minute. Uh, a lot of times when new technologies are deployed, there is some resistance in the organization. Well, you know, we, we've been doing it this way for a long time, or I don't really like this new stuff, that kind of thing. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, you suggest to organizations that they implement good change management practices so that the new technologies will be adopted and used successfully? Absolutely. And, and as again, it's human nature, right? Well, believe it or not, despite of what everybody says about change, you know, I think the only people that like change are, are babies with, with dirty diapers. <laughs> rest of us, rest of us are, you know, creatures of, of habit. I, I like predictability. I, I like the way I do what I do every day, right? So you introducing some new technology or a new process or new way of doing something is going to disrupt that comfort level. So I tend to think of any technology deployment, any change or process uh, in um, implementation or introduction, Michael, almost as a theater act. So, and this would be really useful for field service leaders before, during, after. Before, how can I really plant the seed? How can I really uh, communicate? And here's the key, not that which you want, but that which the consumer of that technology or process or change is going to be better off because of it. So everybody's favorite radio station is WIIFM. What's in it for me? So if you, <laughs> speak, if you speak their language, if you really make it about them and how they're better off because of this early on, you're going to really set the right tone for that during. That's the deployment. The other thing I do in the in the in the early on the process, I'm looking for my champions. Who are those early adopters of technology? Who are those people that embrace new solutions? And this is not an age comment, but my mindset one. Who are the ones that are entrepreneurial? Who are the ones that are digital? Who comes to the table with a growth mindset that are willing to try that new wearable or that new AR VR type technology, right? And I yeah. want to get those people on my side early on. And for your audience, there's a phenomenal called 1990. And uh, this, I think the story will resonate. If last time you threw a party, uh, you know the people that are always kind of the life of the party, they always have the great stories and they always are, you know, they light up a room when they walk in. That's your 1%. 9% are going to interact with them. They might add their story to it. They'll, you know, be around them and they'll, they'll kind of encourage that interaction. 90% are going to be passive observers, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they're not interested. They're just never going to put themselves out there. So I approach every change initiative, again, every technology or process implementation with that 1990 phenomenon in mind, and I'm looking for my 1%. And what I found out is to succeed, our research shows definitively if you identify the 1% and love on them, really help them and create the interaction with the 9%, now you start to get momentum. And at some point, the 90% are going to ask, that's interesting. How did you do that? And can you show me that? And what does that look like? Now you get peer adoption. Now you get peer reviews. Now you get peer support, not an authoritative, not a corporate, not a top down. Yep. If you make it easy for people to understand, do not overcomplicate it. Keep it simple. You do not need to roll out 5,472 features. Let's focus on three. Three features that's going to make their lives easier. Get some momentum. Get some adoption. Get them using it. Then turn on other features. So really set the stage before. Really make it impactful, easy to adopt during. The after is all about reinforcing. The after mm -hmm. is all about recognition. The after is all about putting those that do embrace it on a pedestal and showing how they're better off, in fact, after adopting this new technology, new process, so their peers can see if Joe can do it, so can I. Yeah, I think that's great. I've done some uh, change management myself, and uh, what you've just referred to reminds me of champions, you know, identifying champions. And then, uh, re as you said, reinforcing once the uh, the work is is actually implemented and keeping it simple so that it doesn't become overly complicated. I want to move on just to, to, to a general topic, if I may. You work with a lot of business leaders and some very, very significant companies as well. 
given the circumstances in the world today and the financial situation that's going on today and the, 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 the potential financial situation going forward, what is, what's keeping business leaders up at night? What are, you, what are they telling you that they are concerned about the most and what are they planning or hoping to be able to do about it? That's a great question. I, I actually was on a call with an executive earlier today and their number one challenge and, and opportunity, if you will, is really around this talent. And Michael, that you know, just both yeah. finding talent, but also wage inflation, right? So, you know, not only they can't find them, but you've got, you know, attrition on one side, you've got, you know, I'm paying two to three X what I would pay for the same role a year ago. Hmm. So that is not sustainable. Combine no. that with inflationary pressures, and most believe they're gonna look for they're gonna look for other solutions. They're gonna look for automation, they're gonna look for uh, you know cloud technologies, they're gonna look for some of these AI ML type solutions. And let's make no mistake about it. I, I I'm a realist. It is going to replace some of the jobs, some of the field service jobs that are out there, predominantly because I can make it a heck of a lot more efficient and effective with some of the tools and technologies that are out there. So what we have to do is really think about, and, and they're trying, how do we reskill? How do we upskill? How do we take the, the positive attitude, the, 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 uh, the value that, that tenure has brought, not just in the new talent we recruit, but the talent we have today in really elevating their value add, really aligning that talent with value creation. Uh, and, and we believe, and, and, and I tend to agree with a lot of the conversation I'm having, I think technology will help do some of that. I think uh, minimizing the labor intensity, how long it takes us to do something, how, you know, how many people are involved. Uh, one of my favorite questions when I, when I, either talk to executives or when I go inside a company is, tell me what takes you entirely too long to accomplish. Tell me what frustrates the heck out of you. And those are really low-hanging fruit often mm -hmm. for change management, for process improvement, for really implementation of technology that is going to help them alleviate some of this. And I don't think that labor, uh, the talent challenges are going to go away anytime soon. Uh, but the yeah, wage inflation, it. wage inflation is really a top of mind. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, um, you know, one of the things you said is right in line with what we believe here at Zuper, and that is that uh, we need to elevate the perception and the reality of the uh, uh, the recognition of the reality of the importance that field service technicians and field service engineers play in the entire role of a company and the company's relationship with customers. So, uh, you know, we've written about that, we talk about that, and I'm sure that we will continue to do so, and I imagine we'll engage you in some of those conversations going forward as well. Yeah, yeah I couldn't be a bigger proponent of what you just mentioned, because, again, I, I, I'm honestly not convinced most leaders know what serv really what service organizations do. I mean, I, I kind of intellectually know what you do, but I don't really know how you add value, or I don't really know... How do you, you know, differentiate us? Or I was talking to a, a service executive, Michael, they include a year of service with the initial sale. Mm -hmm. So their whole service organization has to go in after the fact and say, well, how have we done, right? And by the way, would you like to continue that? And, and it's a, in some ways an uphill battle because the rest of the organization is really not incentivized to promote them to make sure they're front and center. And, and you're seeing these challenges, again, designing for serviceability, optimizing the labor market, spare parts supply chain, sustaining engineering. These are all different parts of the service ecosystem that I would submit are not really well understood by rest of the organization, and in particular, how they can be value creators and differentiators for the company. Yeah couple observations, and I think you've heard me say this before, and, and we continue to say it, and that is that we consider service to be the great differentiator that separates your company and your product from, uh, from your competitors. Customers will most likely buy from you more likely based on your service performance than your product performance in many cases. So I uh, think we're, uh, uh, we're, we're right in line. 
unequivocally yes. And think about it a second. Sales, and, and, I, and I cut my teeth on sales. I spent a lot of time in sales, sales management, sales leadership. Sales is, in essence, promising value. From awareness to engagement to evaluation, all the way through purchase, the clients who buy that product or that solution are being promised a value. And we could do a POC, we could do a POV, right, to prove all that. And But once they buy, Michael, you've heard me say this, I genuinely believe when a customer buys, that's when the relationship really starts. Mm -hmm. And the organization that has the biggest impact on not just the value that's promised, but the value that's delivered and the impact that that customer feels from that delivered value is a service organization. It is under-recognized, it is undervalued, and it is often under-invested in, in really elevating the differentiating factor of the organization. Yeah, I mean, we're 100% in sync. And if something you said earlier uh, also struck me because, you know, I've worked in field service all my life. And uh, oftentimes people will ask me what I do, and I'll tell them I work with field service software, and they'll say, well, what is field service? <laughs> so it's it's very interesting because uh, field service really surrounds you everywhere in your business and in your home and just literally everywhere. So see, I would have uh, fun with that. We change your tires, <laughs> we change your battery, we yeah, give yeah, you yeah, rides. No, no. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, okay, let, let, let's move on. This has been a great discussion so far, and and once again, I really admire your your experience and your comments and your ability to mentor and educate and make really valuable suggestions to people. And I think the people that listen to this podcast will be very impressed and pleased with what you've had to say. So just to, before we close out, I know there's some things that you do on a personal level. I know you just finished one of them. I think it was maybe the second one that you did that's kind of a charity event. And I think that's very, very interesting. Would you mind mentioning that for a minute? Oh, you're, you're very kind. Uh, yeah, so uh, when I'm not working, uh, I've become when passionate. Is that? Of, <laughs> right? It's, 20, it's, it's the 27th. Your wife told me to ask you that. When is that? Right? It's 27th <laughs> and 29th hour of every day. Um, yeah, so so uh, oddly enough, my wife and kids bought me a little scooter for Father's Day 12 years ago. And uh, I've become, com before that, I'd never been on a bike, didn't know anything about bikes, and I've become completely passionate about all things two wheels, motorcycles, and uh, so I have several bikes. Uh, my son now rides, my daughter rides. Uh, we, I usually ride about thirty-five to 50,000 miles a year. I've ridden the entire Good Route 66. Lord. I flew to uh, Tuscany pre-pandemic and rode 10 days in Tuscany. Uh, so I recently, uh, this is my actually sixth year, and you you and Rob, Rob also contributed, so thank you, Zuper. Uh, my son and I participated in an annual event called the Distinguished Gentleman's Ride, and it's once a year we can look very Kentucky Derby-ish, so you dress up, mm -hmm. and you actually ride uh, retro, kind of uh, older looking or older bikes, and it's actually raising awareness and funds for men's prostate and mental health. It uh, contributes to the Movember Foundation. It's a global initiative. If the audience is interested, you can go to the gentlemansride.com. It's a website where they do a great job in creating awareness. And yes, some, I want to say 180 cities around the world, a couple hundred thousand people ride in this thing globally. And it's just such an incredible cause. And I'm grateful to, like I said, you and, and Rob both giving to it this year. Yeah, that's great. I know you. Yeah, I first became familiar with it last year, so I think it's an extraordinarily worthwhile cause. Uh, but I must say, you know, once again, I was really hoping I'd hear something interesting from you in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so and, and before, on that, just just on that note, real quickly, and again, it's, I think it's got some value for the audience. Um, you know, I coach. I'm blessed to coach a lot of leaders, work with a lot of leaders. You and I see and meet a lot of field service leaders. I don't know anyone that can burn the candle at both ends. Yeah. Some people do yoga, some people run, some people fly fish. I, I'm indifferent of what or where your happy place is. You just have to find ways to disengage. And our mental health is more important than ever before. Obviously the last two years of this pandemic hasn't helped. So you have to find a way to immerse yourself in digital detox. When I, when I put the earplugs in and I put that helmet on, nobody's calling. Nobody's texting. Nobody wants to have a Zoom meeting with me. And it's my chance to disengage. By the way, I do some amazing thinking on a bike of, you know, I'm riding through Route 66 and I'm thinking how many businesses 
see the highway coming, and yet they don't do anything about their business. And you can't do that sitting in a home office on a computer all day. So whatever your happy place is, you've got to find ways to disengage, go there, you come back refreshed, you come back ready to tackle the world. Words of wisdom for sure. So uh, before we close out, I just want to ask you one last question, if I may. What quality do you admire and value most in the people that you have relationships with? I would say authenticity. Michael, I think uh, most of us have a BS radar, right? And when somebody's not authentic, if somebody's not real, I think we all see right through that. And if you think about the last two years of this global pandemic, we actually haven't spent more time with more people. We spend more time with fewer people. And if you look at the people we've spent time with in the last two years, they're the ones that are a lot like us and they have very similar values and they value relationships and what you see is what you get and, and you want to be around them. The superficial, and this is one of my love-hate relationships with social media, right? All those right. contacts, all those connections mean nothing if you don't know the person, if you don't know what makes them tick, if you don't know, if you're not calling them. For our audience, um, there's this antiquated device called a telephone where you actually pick it up and hit these numbers and the other side picks up and you have this thing called a conversation and you ask great questions about how they're doing and how's their family and what's been going on with them. And so that authenticity uh, is really attractive to me. And I, and I want to, as a matter of fact, I've written in my books, I'm I'm actually trying to practice this of investing, continue to invest time with fewer people, but build deeper, richer, more meaningful relationships. Excellent. Yeah, I'm 100% in agreement with you. Smartphones uh, and technology have kind of uh, diminished the art of conversation these days. It's unfortunate. And it's so, it's so badly missing, especially with the next generation, right? So yes, so yes, I'm yes, teaching yes. my kids and, and the 20-some-year-olds that are coming into the workforce, right? Can they shake your hand and look you in the eye and engage you like a, like a, a, a professional, an adult, and... Are you teaching them how to build relationships? Because that's a skill that will serve them a lifetime. Absolutely. Nor, once again, it's just always a pleasure interacting with you. I really enjoy talking to you. You come up with some great points. And uh, every now and then I write down one of your wonderful Nor nuggets. So thank you again. And Eric, with that, I will turn it back to you to close us off. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I did write down that one of the last Nor Nuggets that were was delivered. Nor, you said something that just struck me, and it was, how many businesses saw the highway coming, and they didn't <laughs> do anything about it? And I, yeah. I know that there are studies out there about how many companies did not adapt to the digital superhighway, right, that, that came, and I mean, that was decades ago. But there were companies that just did not adapt that quote unquote new technology. Oh, it's the internet. What is that? Yeah, no, you should have been there. You should have gotten on board. You should have adapted to that highway. And it makes me wonder, what is that next highway that people are going to have to adapt to? So it's, it's, a, it's a question that I think a lot of business owners are going to be asking. Uh, Michael, I want to ask you this. You, you're, you're here and you really represent what Zuper does uh, in, in an amazing way. Uh, if people are interested in talking about Zuper FM and they want to know more about what you guys do, um, how do they reach out to you? Well, first of all, they should, certainly should go to the website. It's zuper.co, and um, there will be all uh, you know methods uh, or ways shown on the website to contact us. They can also reach out to me directly. Uh, I'm available on LinkedIn, um, so feel free to send a message to me if you want to, uh, and uh, we definitely would get back to you as quickly as possible. Absolutely. I know that's true because you, sir, have not lost the art of conversation. So thank you so much for what you did today, Nor. Thank you so much for being here as a guest. And of course, our last thank you is always for you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to Zuper FM Field Service Your Way with Michael Israel. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Michael comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your colleagues. Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at Zuper FM, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Zuper FM. 
field service your way. Insightful discussions and advice that help you position your field service operations as a powerful force in building enduring customer loyalty. And remember this, when you deliver excellent service to your customers, you're also facilitating their ability to provide superior service to their customers, which strengthens brand loyalty among their customer base as well. Thanks again. Please join us next time.